<coughs> Let's run one hour and then we'll stop and we'll go an hour and then we'll stop. Okay. And then the signal. My name is George Gordon. I'm a small businessman, a chief executive officer of a small corporation in 1978 who started to have some problems with government officials, starting with OSHA, then the EPA, and then the State Tax Commission. And as time progressed along, it became necessary for me to learn something about law in order for my company to survive, in order for me to do business in the real world give you a little illustration of what faces small business or what faces the lay person when he's trying to deal with government and government bureaucracy. And we were dealing with 28 agencies of government spending approximately $200,000 a year on uh, taxes. That's what we paid to those 28 agencies of government. And we were spending approximately 75% of our office budget on the bureaucracy, that is filling out reports, papers, documents. And every one of those documents is also uh, attended with uh, threats of jail, fines, prosecutions. So if you're a small businessman, <coughs> Or even if you're not a small businessman, if you're just a housewife who's driving to the grocery store, you have law to follow and law to obey. And there are approximately two and a half million of these laws in the United States at all levels of government, from the city, the county, the state, and the federal government. And you're expected to know all of those laws and to follow them impeccably. Many of those laws are overlapping and they are vague and ambiguous in that those laws will often contradict one another. That is, you can have an OSHA regulation such as we faced. We put in an $8,000 spray booth only to find out that it didn't meet EPA regulations. So the EPA people came in and said, tear all this out and build it to our standards. Now when you're in a business and you spend eight or $10,000 on a project and then some other government official comes in and says, tear it out, it should tell you that there's something wrong with this type of a system. So when I got into law, I found that oftentimes the bureaucracy, that is the actual agent who comes into your store, has a certain amount of power. But he exceeds the level of his power by 50 to 100 percent. That is, he can move to a certain level, but then we find out that after he's moved to a certain level, then he exceeds that power and he tries to make you believe that his powers are about 50 to 100 percent greater than they really are. Turn the PA system off. I'm sorry. Your PA system is going into all the other rooms. Oh. So they're hearing you. Oh. They should. They should. <laughs> they all should. We all should hear George. <laughs> what do you want me to do, man? Talk up. Can you do it without the we can, okay. no, no, I don't need to hear it. Right. No. Did you just turn it on? So you have a good strong voice. <laughs> All right. Now the average person has a concept of law. And our concept of law is derived from the television set, or from the public school, or from what you heard from Aunt Bertha or Uncle John. But the reality of it is that that is not the way the judicial system in America works. So let me first of all give you the overall view of how the system works. We've all been taught that we enter into a contest with equality. That is, on this side, there are nine players. And on this side, there are nine players. Now, we all read the same rule book. And now we're going to go into the contest, and the contest is supervised by four referees. These people are neutral. They don't take sides. They just call the shots the way they see them. Once in a while, there's a little controversy over to whether or not it's a ball or a strike, but 
Fundamentally, the man at the home plate is calling the balls and the strikes in an impartial manner because he's not on either the Red Sox or the Yankees team. Now, the reality of that is, here's the way this game is played. When we have our team over here, we'll call these the good guys in white, and these are the bad guys in black. In the judicial system over here, we have a judge. And this judge is hired and paid for by the people. And when you get a complaint against you, it's called the people of the state of California versus John Doe. And this judge works for the people of the state of California. So the concept that you have, <clears throat> that this judge is a neutral and an impartial referee is in error. He is not neutral and he is not impartial. He works for the state and if there's a clear-cut strike, he'll call it a strike. And if it's a clear-cut ball, he'll call it a ball. But if it's close, he'll always rule against you. The second fellow that comes into play here is called the prosecutor. The prosecutor is also representing the state. He gets his paycheck every month from the state of California. And he doesn't make any bones about whose side he's on. You'll recognize him instantly because he will come up with railing accusations and oftentimes his accusations are in error. It may be true that you were speeding, and it may be true that you were drunk, but he will probably exaggerate the charges when he says that you resisted arrest and attacked the officer. And this is done so that later on in plea negotiations he can drop the lies and you'll feel really good about pleading guilty to the other crimes that you're charged with, whether or not you actually committed them. The third player in the game is called, excuse me, I got that in there twice, it's called the policeman. Get my policeman. Now there's also no doubt as to whose side he's on. He's going to be the people's chief witness and he's going to testify against you and he's going to tell everybody all of the bad, wicked, terrible things that you've done. He'll oftentimes lie. Now in 13 years of practical on-site uh, observation and experience, I can tell you that I've only met one policeman who ever told the truth when he was on the witness stand. Every other policeman that I've put on the stand and examined either directly or on cross-examination has lied. Now, of course, the lies depend upon the circumstances and how much he wants to go and how far he wants to go in perjure testimony. But except for one, and I have interviewed and examined dozens, they all lie almost all the time. And then, we have the public defender. You'll always notice that the government wants you to accept the public defender. In fact, it almost works like this. If you walk into court and say, I'm going to defend the case myself, pro se, and the judge will shake his head like, you fool. And he will warn you, and he will severely admonish you and tell you about how serious this is, and that you're up against a paid professional, and that you don't have a chance, and that you'd better allow me, the judge, to appoint the public defender for you, because this public defender costs you nothing. So he appeals to your greed and your lust, and your opponent, the prosecutor, he also shakes his head like, oh, you poor, you poor nitwit. Now, these are two of the fellows who are against you. See the prosecutor and the judge now, they're working against you. <clears throat> Doesn't it tell you something right about here? Because the moment you acquiesce and you say, all right, judge, I'll take the public defender. He smiles and he says, very wise. 
very smart. And then the prosecutor nods in agreement with sage wisdom. And now your opponents have agreed that this public defender is a very valuable ally that you need. Well, wait a minute. These are the two fellows that are trying to put you in jail. And when you accept the public defender, they nod in agreement. Doesn't that tell you something's wrong? Because the public defender over here is the sleeper. You see, he really is one of the bad guys. And the moment you put him on your team, you now have eight guys working for you, and you have one working against you on your team. It's kind of like playing a football game, and the quarterback throws the long pass, and the pass receiver goes to catch it, but oops, slips, and it falls on the ground. He says, darn. How would you like to have that working on your team? Well, that's what you have with the public defender. And when I interviewed Larry Richards, who was a public defender for Richmond, California for six years. I said, Larry, how many cases have you done as the public defender in Richmond in six years? And he said, well, I don't know, but it's many hundreds of cases. We don't know, but it's several hundred. I said, Larry, how many of those cases did you win while you were the public defender representing defendants? And he said, why, it isn't the public defender's job to win a case. I said, well, what is your job? And he said, it's my job to protect the defendant's rights so that all of his rights are available to him at all times, which in plain language says, my job is to eliminate all appealable error so that when this guy is convicted, he has absolutely nothing to take to the appeals court. That's his job, and they do it well. Now, these four fellows are actually working against you, the sleeper in here. And you see, if this guy was actually over here on this side, you'd be better off. Because now it would be 10 to 9. And at least you know that there was 10 guys on that side and 9 guys on our side. But when this fellow comes over on your side, it's even worse than that. Now let's add in another factor that comes into play. The judge, the prosecutor, and the public defender are all attorneys, and they belong to a very select group. There are only 635,000 of these people in the United States, and they're all trained in the law, and they all belong to the same union called the American Bar Association. Now as I pointed out to you on uh, I believe it was Wednesday or Thursday. And when this public defender comes into the game over here, his duty is not to his client. His duty is to, first of all, the court, because he's an officer of the court. His second duty is to the people. Well, it's the people who are prosecuting you, and it's the judge or the court over here that's representing the people. And then his third duty is to you. Now, you're paying the bill. <coughs> Even though you've been told that the public defender is free, that's not true. You see, if at any time in the future you come up with enough money, they'll come back and lay it against you and charge you the money for the public defender, even if it's five or 10 years from now. So he's not free, and he also works for the state. And another factor comes into play. These people are probably all Masons. I'm from Ozark County, Missouri. Every public official in Ozark County is a Mason. All of the law enforcement officials are Masons because the sheriff is a Mason and he will only hire a deputy who is a Mason. Now, if you're a Mason, I don't want to offend you. I just want to point out the realities of life for the rest of us. Does that mean there are no Catholic judges or prosecutors? Oh, no. There are Catholics and there are Mormons. And when Those you go... Masons, Pardon? But they don't usually call them the Masons. Yeah, typically they do if they're judges or prosecutors. But watch this. When you're in Idaho and Utah, they're all Mormons. 
So you have the same problem there that you have in Ozark County, Missouri. It's just that you have a different cast of characters. <coughs> when you go to Chicago and Minneapolis, they're all Catholic. Right. And when you go to Georgia, they're all Baptists. And so the point I'm making is, is that it's wonderful if you're a Mason and you go in before a Mason judge because now you can give him the grand hailing sign of a Mason in distress and you're in safe hands with the Masonic judge. But what do you do if you're not a Mason? Now let's complicate this just one step further. Whose rules are we going to play this scenario by? Yeah, you got it. It's the court rules. Now you've got a judge who works for the state, the prosecutor works for the state, the policeman works for the state, the public defender works for the judge. All of them are Masons. They all belong to the American Bar Association, <coughs> save for the policeman. And we're going to play the game by their rules. Now, let's you go into this forum, and what do you think your chances of winning are? Zero. Not quite. Six percent. Statistically, if you walk into this scenario, you'll win 6% of the time and lose 94. Now, over the years, I've learned from my mistakes, and my ratio is 86% wins and 14% losses. I've done 51 wins, 8 losses, and I have 5 in litigation. Now, I've directed my wife's defense over the last 5 years in 10 legal matters, and she's won 10 out of 10. I have other students that have won on a consistent basis in the 90 percentile. If we can't win in the 80 to 90 percentile range, there's no purpose in going into court. Because if you're going to go in and lose 94 percent of the time, for practical purposes, you might as well say, I'm going to lose every time I go in there. Now, you don't have to go in to lose. You could plead guilty and save everybody a lot of time, effort, and energy. And the judge will like it when you plead guilty. And he'll give you about half the sentence. So one day I woke up and I said, well, what would I have to do in order to play the game and be a consistent winner? Well, I found out that when I go up against these people with their rules, and then I'm going to go up against the Masonic Order, or in the case of Idaho, up against the, the uh, Mormon judges. But I was going to have to do something a little different. So let me give you a little idea as to what we might do differently. The lawyers have what's called a marketing program. You know, when you're selling carpet, you have to have a marketing program. I have a marketing program, and what you see today is a part of my marketing strategy. It's obvious that I have to have customers, and it's obvious that the lawyer has to have customers, isn't it? Now, until a few years ago, lawyers couldn't advertise. They had a rule in the Bar Association that they wouldn't advertise. Now they advertise. You don't see them advertise very much, nowhere near what you see in the way of Coca-Cola or Kmart or Montgomery Wards or Pennies, but you're starting to see now a little more advertising. But the attorneys have a, a better system of marketing than we might have given them credit for. Let me illustrate. Let's suppose that you're charged with a crime. You've never been to law school. You have no knowledge of law. You don't know what the strategy or procedure of a courtroom drama is other than what you've seen Perry Mason do. And of course, there's always this dramatic ending at the end of a Perry Mason show in which the guilty party rises in the back of the courtroom and confesses. I've yet to see that occur in the real world. Now, in Hollywood, it occurs every time Raymond Burr does a case. But in my experience, the answer was, no, it doesn't work that way at all. <coughs> so the first thing you do when you're charged with a crime is bail yourself out of jail. Here you are locked up and you say, well, number one, I've got a bail. You don't know, <clears throat> you don't understand that when you pay bail, you commit to the jurisdiction of the court, even if you were the Queen of England charged with a traffic offense in Denver, 
The moment she bails out of jail, she says, for the purposes of this case, I'm the proper person to come in and defend against this case. So if you wanted to raise a jurisdictional defect, you've waived it here when you paid to get out. Now secondly, you want to hire a lawyer. And preferably a good lawyer. Doesn't everyone advise you that you should hire a good lawyer? Then I agree, there must be some bad ones. Now the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Warren Berger in 1977, made this observation when he said 90% of the trial lawyers in America are incompetent. My experience dovetails the Chief Justice's observations. I don't know if it's 70% or 80% or 90%, but I know that it's way over half, and your chances of finding a good lawyer are very rare. But compounding this problem is the attorney's marketing strategy. Because the moment you hire this attorney over here, he takes you in and he has you plead not guilty. Now the moment you plead not guilty, you have reduced this controversy to a single clear-cut issue of fact. And you have waived any legal arguments that you might want to bring in to the preliminary hearing. And the first thing the attorney will tell you is that we're going to waive our preliminary hearing. Which means that if you had a legal defense as opposed to a factual defense, we're going to waive that and go right straight to trial. Let me tell you, I never waive preliminary hearing, and sometimes I have to really scramble to get one. Sometimes it has to be a show cause hearing or a motion to dismiss for want of impersonum jurisdiction or some other technical move. But in a felony, you're entitled to the preliminary hearing, and your lawyer always waives it. This preliminary hearing comes within 14 days of your arrest. You should want a preliminary hearing then? Pardon? You, you should request a preliminary hearing then? Yeah, in a, in a felony, you're always entitled to a preliminary hearing. In a misdemeanor, you're oftentimes not, which means then that you're going to have to scramble to get your preliminary hearing. But you see, nobody places any value on it. And your attorney now is going to waive the preliminary hearing. It's a part of the marketing strategy because he wants to take you to trial, which is number five. And he charges you $5,000 to try the case which obviously is a part of his marketing strategy because if he went into the preliminary hearing and he had the case dismissed as a matter of law, he couldn't charge you $5,000 to do the trial. And this hearing is only worth $250. So does he want to win at preliminary hearing for $250 when he can waive preliminary hearing and you don't even know what it's for and go directly to trial and sell you the $5,000 trial program. Now, when the lawyer goes to trial, he does his darndest to put on a hell of a show. Yeah. I mean, he jumps up and down and rants and raves and paws the ground and bites the bushes and pulls his hair, and he looks frustrated, and he objects timely, and he puts on a good show. But the question is, does your attorney want to win at trial or lose? And the answer is, he always wants to lose because if he loses, now you're faced with five years in the slammer, but a motion for stay of execution pending appeal will give you about one more year of freedom and cost you $15,000 for appeal. When he does this 10 times, 30% of the time, you will go with this attorney with the appeal, which now puts $20,000 in his pocket. Now, he may or may not win on appeal, which is totally irrelevant, because he's not the guy who's going to jail. Now, can you understand, with what we've discussed so far, that an attorney is the kiss of death 
In fact, there's four of these kisses of death that everybody goes for. And it's understandable because, after all, it's the only thing you know. So for your fee today, if you learn nothing more than what I'm showing you now, it's worth $20,000 to you the next time you have a case. So when I said that I would show you today why it is that for the fee you're paying, I'll guarantee you that it's worth at least 10 times the amount that you're paying, just what I've told you so far tells you the answer to that riddle. Now let me show you why it is that when you go in and plead, number one, not guilty, you are doomed <coughs> to lose. And now somebody says, well, the only other alternative is to plead guilty. Who told you that? You see, there are seven pleas that you could enter here when you walked into the courtroom on arraignment day. But does the judge tell you what those seven are, or does he, like any good salesman, say to you, we have red and green carpet, and we're down to one roll each. And if you don't act now, you're going to lose this value forever. You ever heard that? Yeah. <coughs> so he says, do you want to buy the red carpet or the green carpet? Do you want to plead guilty or not guilty? Try this. Uh, well, Your Honor, let's see. Let me plead uh, double jeopardy today and see what he says. Or tell him you want to plead uh, non-assumption or non-assumption. A-S-S-U-M-P-S-I-T. Or maybe double jeopardy, non-assumption, no low contender, I'll stand mute, or I'll make a plea in abatement. You see, he didn't tell you about the other five pleadings, and I'll confess this, that it may or may not be appropriate because of the circumstances that are involved. But you'd think now that this judge, if he were neutral, you see, if he were an umpire on the baseball diamond, you'd think that, well, if it's a ball, it's a ball. If it's a strike, it's a strike. But it's like I told you, if there's any close calls, they'll always be against you. And in this case, he's not going to tell you of the other five pleadings that you could make between or in, in addition to guilty or not guilty. The second thing you do is you hire an attorney. <clears throat> when you hire the attorney, you create what's called the guardian ward relationship. You become a ward of the court. This is where the judge wants you because now he controls both attorneys and the defense. Now, if you went in there pro se, you'd have your Bill of Rights working for you. You'd be the only person in there with rights, and you would have a shot at winning. Now, the reason that I can win so consistently <clears throat> is because when I go into the court, I know going in that it's 13 to 8. There's 13 of those guys. There's 8 on my team. And we're going to play by their rules, and then they're going to cheat at every turn. But now I can win because I know what I'm up against. When you go in there thinking that justice is blind and the judge is fair, you can't win because now you see you've got this invader, this imposter, this spy working on your team called the public defender, who's in reality working in cahoots with the judge and the prosecutor. And they go in to chambers and decide what they're going to do for you. This first came to my attention when I was doing a case with my attorney. And the witness on the stand was lying pretty, pretty consistently. And I kept nudging my attorney. I said, now you get him on that. Now you get him on this. And don't you forget to ask him about that. Well, when the other side got through with direct examination, my attorney got up and said, I don't have any questions for this guy, and I couldn't hold it myself anymore. So I jumped up and I said, well, I object. I've got some questions for him. And the judge practically came across the altar as he said, Mr. Gordon, you're in contempt of court. One more outburst like this and I'll hold you in contempt. You sit down. Your attorney will answer and speak to the court for you. I hadn't been told that.
that since I was five years old. My daddy said, little boys five years old should be seen and not heard. You know, I was 35, 40 years old, and I'm paying this klutz $6,000 a year plus the cost of the litigation. I thought I was the boss. I thought that when I hired some guy to come work in my factory, that I'm the guy that tells you, here's what you're going to do and here's what you're not going to do. Boy, was I wrong. But fortunately, I learned from that experience that now that I see how this game is played, I'm treated like I'm a five-year-old kid. So I never hired another attorney. In fact, I fired that one, and I went on to win the next 16 cases in a row. Now, I figured I could go in and lose free. I didn't even plan on going in to win. I just said, I'm going to lose, but I'm not going to pay anything to do it anymore. Now, you've pled not guilty. Your attorney now reduces you to a ward, which makes you simply a pawn to be dealt with as the prosecutor, the judge, and your attorney determine they want to play. And the third thing is, they always tell you to get a jury. Now, the jury can only listen to the facts. They can't listen to issues of the law, and I'm going to show you what happens when this comes down in a moment. And then the fourth item over here, you're told to exercise your Fifth Amendment rights. Now, you've got a Sixth Amendment right to an attorney, you've got a Seventh Amendment right to a jury, and you've got a Fifth Amendment right not to testify. No testimony. And your attorney, the judge, and the prosecutor are all adamant that you shouldn't waive any of your rights and you should demand all of your rights and we're here to guarantee them. And when you do this, you have the kiss of death working against you because when you don't testify, you run against the rules of evidence. And under the rules of evidence, all I have to do is make an allegation. <clears throat> I don't have to prove my allegation, I just have to make it. And Rule 7A of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure say this, there shall be a complaint and there shall be an answer. And if you fail to answer, then you have conceded that the allegation is true. And there is no contested issue of fact to be decided. So if I say to you, I allege that your shirt is green. Let's wait for a moment and see whether or not there's any contested issue of fact. Since there's no contested issue, obviously, for the purposes of this hearing, the shirt's green. So if during the proceedings, or if during appeal, this guy raises the issue that, no, my shirt is blue and white, check. Objection, Your Honor. It goes beyond the scope of the pleadings. It's irrelevant and immaterial, and the issue has already been settled. Now do you see what I've done? You've exercised your Fifth Amendment right now you can put your head between your knees and kiss her goodbye, because it's all over. Now let me show you an illustration. Let's suppose an MP walks in and he says, George Gordon, you're under arrest for being absent without leave from Fort Lewis, Washington. Now that's a pretty preposterous charge. You know, he could come in here and he could make that allegation against anyone in here, couldn't he? charge you, whatever your name is, with being absent without leave from Fort Lewis. <clears throat> Let's analyze that illustration. Assuming that I'm rational and the MP comes in and I go away quietly, he's going to take me down to downtown Denver to the federal courthouse before a grand jury to get an indictment. Is that correct? How many of you think that's what's going to happen? That's exactly correct. <clears throat> we are not going to downtown Denver. How many of you think he's going to take me before a magistrate to set bail? No bail, no magistrate, no grand jury, no common law rights. <clears throat> We're going straight to Fort Lewis and to the brig. Now, about Monday, they're going to bring me before the provost marshal, and the provost marshal is going to say, Sergeant Gordon, 
you've been charged with a violation of the Uniform Code of Military Justice in that you've been absent without leave between July of 1989 and July of 1990. How do you plead to that charge? Guilty or not guilty? I mean, they give you the answer. You can't go wrong, can you? <laughs> and so, obviously, you want to plead not guilty, right? Because that's the way we've all been programmed. But the moment you plead not guilty, you're saying, in effect, here's the effect of the law. Mr. Prosecutor, I agree with you that the issue to be decided is, am I or am I not absent? Do I or do I not have a liberty card? And was I absent with or without leave? But what is the question that we really want the court to decide? Do we want to go into court and have the judge decide, was I absent with or without leave? Or do we want him to answer this question? Is George Gordon a soldier or not? The moment I plead not guilty, I concede the issue of law. And I admit to the issue of fact. Let's take a look. Number one, does anybody here know my name? George Bush. I'll stipulate to that. So the first issue is, is this George Gordon? And yep, he's got the right guy. And secondly, he says that I'm absent from Fort Lewis. Where are we today? We're in Denver, aren't we? We're not in Fort Lewis. Am I absent from Fort Lewis? Let me stipulate to this. I haven't been in the state of Washington for three or four years. Have I been absent without leave from Fort Lewis, Washington? The third issue is, do I have any leave? I'll stipulate to that. I don't have anybody's permission from Fort Lewis, Washington to be here today. Do you? <laughs> the allegation that I'm absent from Fort Lewis is exactly true. So let's take a look at the facts. Fact number one, I am the proper party to the action because my name is George Gordon and the complaint and the warrant for my arrest identified George Gordon as the party that we want to answer this allegation. Number two, it alleges that I'm absent from Fort Lewis. Five, I'm absent. And that I'm absent from Fort Lewis and that I'm absent without leave. And factually, that's exactly correct. So when I walk into trial and I try to defend against these five factual allegations, what are my chances of winning? Zero. No. Six percent. Six percent. For practical purposes, we could say that it's zero. But the reality of life is there's a vagary in jury trials that no one can explain. They turn guilty people loose and they convict innocent people every day. But then that's the vagaries of a jury trial. Now, I've only done two jury trials in my career, and I'll probably never do another one. I lost both. Taught me a lesson, though, that when you go before a jury, you can't win. And now I found out why. Now, let me show you an illustration as to why you can't win. One time I wanted to test a constitutional question. Article 1, Section 9 of the Federal Constitution, where it bars or prohibits any state from compelling a vessel to enter, clear, and pay duties in the port of entry. So I took my truck and I ran the scale at Bliss, Idaho. The police came out and arrested me and took me to jail. After the preliminaries, we set trial, and when we went to trial, an issue of fact arose. And the issue was, did George Gordon stop at the scale or didn't it? Because I pled not guilty. I had a jury trial, and here's the way the statute reads, and this is what we deal with when we talk about code pleading. The judge's name was Judge Becker. He'd been on the bench 14 years when this case came down, about 1979 or 80. Now, the judge for eight years had been writing to and had been calling for judiciary action concerning the statute that I had challenged, and it was Idaho Code 
27. Here's the essentials of the statute. It said, all trucks loaded with colon, and then it listed from 1 through 40 of the commodities that were included in the statute. It included imported goods, exported goods, manufactured goods, raw materials, steel, furniture, iron, coal, and so on down the line. When you got through reading the list, I think you would concede that there was nothing on planet Earth that wasn't included on a truck that would have to stop, enter, clear, and pay duties in the port of entry. And then it concluded, it shall stop, clear, and pay duty <coughs> in a port of entry. And a legal question devolves upon who is required to stop, enter, clear, and pay duty. Now down the road, one mile from the exit, it says in clear, bold, white letters on a green background on Interstate 84, all trucks exit next right. Pickups under 6,000 gross vehicle weight and recreational vehicles excluded. Now I'm driving a truck. Out of that information that I just gave you, who's required to stop, enter, clear, and pay duty? You've got to make that judgment. Who? The policeman? No, you. All right. Well, I made a judgment, and my judgment was I'm not required, and I charged right on through. But the policeman didn't see it that way. He came out, arrested me, and took me off to jail and said, you're in violation of the law. So when I went in, I pled not guilty. Now, as the trial was proceeding, the state goes first, and the state created its prima facie case and closed at 5 minutes to 12. When the state closed, they arrested their case, and I said, I object, Your Honor, and I move to dismiss for failure of the state to prove its prima facie case. And the judge leaned forward, and he said to me, Well, Mr. Gordon, what is it about the state's prima facie case that they failed to prove? And I said, and he said, well, I do, but I won't. Now let's break for lunch, and we'll reconvene at 1.30. Well, you know, when the judge comes in at 1.30, he normally comes in from the side door over here, and the bailiff, you know, he announces the judge's presence and says, all rise, please. Well, this was a little different case. I was sitting here at the front at the defendant's table and the judge came through the back door with his robes flying in the breeze as he walked down the center aisle. He stopped at my table, put his arm on my shoulder and he says, God, I wish I had this case. I'd win it in five minutes. <laughs> he went on up and he sat down, convened court and he said, now Mr. Gordon, is the defense ready to move forward? So I said, uh, yes, the defense is ready to move forward. And so I went on for about the next three hours until 4.30. And I ranted and raved and jumped up and down, pawed the ground, bit the bushes, and did all those things that defendants are supposed to do in their defense. And when we got all through with the case, I arose at the critical moment and I said, now, I'm moving to dismiss for failure of the state to prove its prima facie case. And the judge leaned forward again and he said, what did the state fail to prove? You see, I thought the judge was supposed to know because he's the judge. 
He'd already told me that he knew, but he wouldn't because I had failed in my burden to show what the state had failed to prove. So he said, well, in that case, I'm not going to dismiss. I'm going to send it to the jury, and he charged the jury. And jury instruction number one said, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if you find that Mr. Gordon failed to stop enter, clear, and pay duty in the port of entry, then you must find him guilty as a matter of law. Jury instruction number two. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if you find that Mr. Gordon did stop, enter, clear, and pay duties in the port of entry, then you must find him not guilty as a matter of law. Now, how do you think the policeman testified? He didn't stop. How did you think I testified? I didn't stop. So there was no contested issue of fact as to whether or not I stopped or not. And what was the judge's instructions to the jury? So he says to the jury, now go out and find a true and just verdict. <laughs> and they left. Well, a few minutes later, the judge's clerk came in. Strange occurrences going on this day. And she said to me, the judge is available. And turned on her heel and walked out. Well, I was there with a buddy and I said, I wonder what she meant by that. Let's go ask the judge and find out. So we went back to the judge's office and the clerk said, right this way, Mr. Gordon. And she ushered me and my friend into the judge's chambers with all the high backed overstuffed chairs, you know, where we go in to negotiate the fate of, of criminals and people. And, and so we sat down in the big chairs and pretty soon the judge came flying through the door over here, whipped off his cape like Superman, hung it up over here, grabbed his pipe and he said, God, you did a hell of a job today. That was a hell of a defense. And he's stuffing his pipe and then he sits down and he strikes a match, and puts his feet up on the desk and he goes puff, puff, well, how do you think the jury will come back? <laughs> and I said, well, I, I don't know. This is my, my first case. And he says, is that so? I said, well, how do you think the jury will come back? Oh, they'll come back guilty, all right. And I said, well, why do you think they'll come back guilty? Because I told them to. <laughs> he didn't mince any words or beat around the bush. He told the jury what the answer to the riddle was, hadn't he? Right. Yeah. And then he said, you know, I've been working for eight years with the Judiciary Committee on this very statute. I've sent letters to the Supreme Court, I've sent letters to the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and they haven't listened to a word I've said. And you know the first guy that argues that statute correctly? I'm gonna cut him loose. Oh my. I thought, hmm, I wonder what this is all about. So I asked him a couple of more questions along that line, and he said, well, now let me tell you, did you code plead this statute? I didn't want to admit that I'd never heard the word code plead before, so I said, well, I read the statute. He says, well, damn it, didn't you see what the prima facie burden was? Prima facie burden? Yeah, when the state charges you with a crime, what is it that they have to come in and prove? Notice here that all trucks loaded with, who doesn't have to stop? Empty trucks. Empty trucks aren't included. And the principle of law is very simple. The intent of the lawmaker is the law. So all trucks unloaded don't have to stop. And so the state's case revolved around whether or not the truck was loaded. That's why the judge said, what did they fail to prove? And my answer, they failed to prove the truck was loaded. And he would have dismissed. <coughs> but since I didn't know, 
He couldn't represent me and give me the answer. He had to appear to be the impartial judge. So he said, now I had to submit it to the jury. Now, if I were the fact finder, had you tried this case in front of me, I would have dismissed the case for failure of the state to prove its prima facie case on my own motion because the state failed to prove the truck was loaded and you failed to confess that it was loaded. Therefore, as the fact finder, the state has failed to prove that you're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But, Mr. Gordon, you demanded a jury trial, didn't you? And now your fate is in the hands of housewives, mechanics, and farmers who don't know the law. And my first jury instruction was, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if you find that Mr. Gordon failed to stop, enter, clear, and pay duty in the port of entry, you must find him guilty. Mr. Gordon, as a matter of fact, you are guilty. But he says, as a matter of law, you're innocent. Because, you see, we don't know whether your truck was loaded or not, so I have to presume it was empty. And if the truck was empty as a matter of law, you were in compliance with the law. So you've been tried for a crime that may not have been committed, which occurs 90% of the time. Because a crime requires two elements. It requires intent with the act. And no prosecutor will come into court and prosecute a case that he cannot factually prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And you can't bring in the issue of law at trial. The issue of law has already been conceded when you made your pleading at arraignment and your opportunity to recover at preliminary hearing. Now, let me show you how to recover. Now that I knew the answer to the riddle, <laughs> and the jury came back, how do you think they came back? Guilty. Guilty. This is the first case I ever won on appeal. <laughs> I took it up on appeal and won a reversal. Now I was guilty as hell. That truck was loaded to the gun. <laughs> I thought you were going to say jurisdiction. <laughs> no, I can win a case whether I'm guilty or innocent. It's not really relevant. In this particular case, I was guilty as hell. <laughs> I've also been convicted when I was innocent, <laughs> which is what I told you. See, it doesn't have any relevance as to whether or not you're guilty or innocent. It has to do with the way you play the game. So I went back to the factory, and we built a big battlement on top of the truck. So we've got this van body here, see? And well, we built this battlement up here, two feet high, 20 feet long. We brought the truck up to 14 feet. We covered this with a tarp, and we went around, and this truck's full of rivet holes. And we siliconed all the rivet holes so that you couldn't look inside. And then there was a rubber gasket on the back door, and I replaced it. And then I backed the truck up to the loading ramp dock, and I brought in the loading supervisor, the plant superintendent, and one other workman, and I said, look in this truck. Do you see any cargo? And they all said, no, I don't. I said, close the doors. And we put a padlock on the doors, and we gave the key to the plant superintendent who rode in the chase car with the other two witnesses. And then we drove this truck down to the same scale, and at the bottom of the hill, we let the air out of the tires so that it would look like it was really loaded to the gunnels. <laughs> then I put it in fifth over at 20 miles an hour and chugged by the scale shack. Blah, 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 blah. Boy, those guys were out like bees <clears throat> robbing a nest. And they ordered me to come back to the scale, so we turned her around crossed the median, went back down the freeway, crossed the median again, and the policeman, and he drove across the scale over there, you know, the one I was following, and then there were two of them behind me. So I quickly cut the truck around behind the scale shack, parked it, jumped out, slammed the door shut, took the ignition key, and I threw it into the weeds. 
Now that we create reasonable suspicion under Terry and probable cause under Miranda, yeah. boy, were those guys mad. <laughs> so they got on the telephone and they tried to get a Fourth Amendment warrant from Judge Becker. Now, I couldn't hear what Becker was saying, but I could hear what the guy was saying to him on this end. He said, yep, and he threw the key into the brush over there. We don't know what that truck's loaded with, but there's contraband of some kind in there, Judge. <laughs> <laughs> and so they kept talking. And, no, no, well, no, well, no, no, yes, yeah, no, no, yes. Pretty soon he hangs up and he says, I don't understand it. The judge won't give us a warrant. So he wrote me a ticket. Well, now the three guys that are behind me, see, they're all ready to testify as to whether this truck had a load in it or whether it stopped and picked up a load and dropped one off in the 65 miles between Boise and Gooding. So now I've created my prima facie case, and I've got my witnesses, and we're ready to go. Now we've got three policemen that we need to subpoena in. But this time, we're not going to trial. We're going to a motion hearing. So I called up a motion hearing with a motion to dismiss for failure of the state to prove its prima facie case. Subpoenaed in the three policemen, and I wrote up 25 questions. And I brought policeman number one in, and I put him on the stand, and I said, would you please state your name and address and your occupation for the record? And I asked him such innocuous questions as, were you on duty the night of June 10th, 1979? Yes, I was, and what's your duties, and what were you doing, and I'm the head waymaster, and etc. Question number 18 asked this question. What was the truck loaded with? And he said, I don't know. Did you weigh the truck? No, we didn't. <clears throat> did you look inside of the truck? No, we didn't. Did you inspect the truck? Yes, we did. Was the driver driving while intoxicated? No, he wasn't. Did he have a driver's license? Yes, he did. Was the truck properly registered? Yes, it was. Thank you. You're a witness. Well, the prosecutor concentrated on about 10 or 15 questions, and he said, what time of day was this? Well, it was 7.30 in the afternoon. Since this was June 10th and the sun was up pretty late, was there clear visibility and was there a sign, and did the sign say, all trucks exit next right? So they proved that only a blind worm could have missed the sign that said, all trucks exit next right. So when they got through, they proved conclusively that there was a sign that said all trucks exit next right. I brought all three policemen in, answered the same questions. Now remember, I'm sitting here with my three witnesses, and what are my three witnesses going to testify to? Empty truck. That the truck was empty. But in this case, it wasn't necessary to call my three witnesses, was it? <laughs> because my three opponents all testified that they didn't know what it was loaded with. Right. So if the state's prima facie case is based upon whether or not the truck's loaded and their testimony that yes, the truck was loaded, it was loaded with furniture, and he didn't stop. That's their burden. And they all testified, gee, we don't know. So they got all through and the judge said, now, Mr. Prosecutor, when we go to trial, are you going to bring any other witnesses in? And the prosecutor said, no. Are you going to bring any scientific evidence or are you going to bring in any other evidence which would tend to prove any material fact not already testified to here today. Uh, no, Your Honor. He looked over at me and he said, Now, Mr. Gordon, when we go to trial, are you going to produce any other witnesses? And I said, Yes, sir. Are they present in the courtroom? I said, Yes, these three witnesses. One, two, three, right over here. Are you going to bring in any other <coughs> evidence which would, which would be relevant in this case? I said, Yes, sir, I am. He said, okay, thank you. He said, having heard the testimony and the witnesses today, it's the conclusion of this court that the state does not have a prima facie case. Therefore, case is dismissed. And he got up and walked out. Now, there was about 15 policemen in here. Because just the week before, they laid me away, remember? And they're all sitting there saying, how much did he pay for that? I got him four more times on the same issue. <laughs> four more. That's very true. <laughs> yeah, it is. But it illustrates this fact, <clears throat> that the courtroom is not a place that you go into because it's fair. It's a place that you go into because you're a superior and a more skillful litigant than your opponent. 
You either know how to play the game and play the game by the rules that are set down by somebody else in such a manner that you can defeat your opponent on a regular and consistent basis so you have no business in there. Now I like to tell this story because it's one of 51 stories I could tell you along the same lines of cases that I've done in which there was a move to be made like a chess game. Law is like chess. And the more skillful player in the game is the fellow who usually always wins. Now, it always helps if you're innocent. Let me point that out. That being innocent is 90% of the battle. But I could be guilty and win also. And I've done that many times. But it came to my attention that when I defeat my opponent, the next time he's not going to make that mistake. And the next time he's going to come back after me with a vengeance, which told me that I'd better learn how to comply with the law, but make him think that I'm in violation. Then I'd come back and sue him under the Civil Rights Act and make some money. Now, with this under our belts, let's take a 10 minute break right here. Let me, before I take a break, you might want to write this in your notes. My address is Post Office Box 297, and I'm in Isabella, Missouri. My name is George Gordon, and I teach civil and constitutional law, courtroom strategy and procedure. And uh, the zip code is 65, let's see, 65, uh-oh, can't remember the zip code. Well, I'll just write my name, George Gordon, spell out the word Missouri, and they'll deliver it anyway. 65676, isn't that what it is? And it's on my six five six seven, six, seven, 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 seven. Or you can call me at area code four one seven two seven three four nine six seven. If you're interested in any of our schools or any of our program over there, you can get in touch with me at a later date. Let's take a ten minute break right here and don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. All right, we're ready here for lesson two. Now I handed out a two-page two documentary here that has some books that I recommend. And people ask me this quite often. As a pro se litigant, what books do I need to pursue this concept of pro se litigation? This is the answer. There are nine of them. When you go to the law library, such as uh, the Supreme Court Law Library in Boise, Idaho, there are 40,000 volumes in there. Now, I have a law library at my school to give you a little illustration. The U.S. Supreme Court reports cost $8,000, and the U.S. Code costs $3,500. Corpus Juris Secundum costs $3,000. Those are encyclopedias, and those are legal research books, and those are very valuable additions to a law library, and I'm really glad to have them. But when you get right down to where push comes to shove, you know, you could live your whole life without the U.S. Supreme Court reports. And you can argue a case successfully in court without corpus juris secundum. But there are some books here that you cannot do without. And they start off with what's called the trial book. It's published by West Publishing Company of St. Paul, Minnesota. I also have the book that I publish for my students. And it's $30. Well, it's six ounces of silver. The guy that wrote this up, one of my students, and he ordered from each one of these names and addresses so that if you want to order these, you can order them yourself. The second one here is called the Federal Criminal Code and Rules, West Publishing Company, which also includes the Federal Civil Judicial Procedure and Rules and the Federal Rules of Evidence. They're 17, 1650, and 1095. They're all published by West Publishing Company. Let me tell you what you're dealing with here. The trial book has 11 chapters, and it identifies each step in the judicial process of a jury trial. There are 11 steps in a jury trial. What do you think your chances of winning a case are if you don't even know what the 11 steps are, much less what to do at each step? Now, <laughs> <laughs> Probably less than 6% unless you've got an attorney. All right, so the trial book then 
is an indispensable part of laying out a coherent presentation. What it really does, it's, it's a publication for attorneys, and its objective is to place in front of the attorney the first thing you do, which is at the arraignment, what do you do at arraignment, and what are your options? And then what's the next thing you're going to do? Preliminary hearing. How do you carry out a preliminary hearing? What would you do when you got there? How would you call one up? And so on down the line. The last chapter has to do with appeal, assuming that we lose the case. Now we need to take it to appeal. How would we file a notice of appeal, the appellate brief, and argue the case to the appellate court? Now, the Federal Criminal Code and Rules is an absolute necessity because if you don't know what the rules of the game are, how in the hell are you going to win? It's impossible. It would be like a quarterback who's going to the Super Bowl, but he doesn't know what the rules of football are. It's preposterous on its face. Now, to show you how many rules there are, there's 83. And there's about 10. So there's 830 rules. Now, you don't have to memorize every rule, but there are four key rules, and when you come to the civil rights class, I'll show you that you must be able to defeat your opponent on Rule 7A, Rule 8A2, Rule 12B6, and Rule 56. If you can't defeat your opponent on those four rules, you cannot win. But once you know what those four rules are, the other 79 rules come into play only when your opponent brings it up. Well, when he brings it up, all you have to do is go to the rule book and find out what the rules require me to do in response to his call of the rule. How simple that is. But on the other four, it is not dependent upon him calling the rule. And you've got to be able to answer Rule 7a. There shall be an answer and a complaint in Rule 8a2. That answer cannot be overly broad. 12b6 must state a claim upon which relief can be granted. And then Rule 56 is called the Rule for Summary Judgment. It has to be a verified answer. It's the only rule like that. And the reason that these tricky rules are placed in the book is so that no one can accidentally get through the maze. No one will ever accidentally get through the maze. You must know how the maze is set up and which turns to make. And that's what I teach. I know the way through the maze. There's no big, big mystery to it. Once you know, you know. That's the end of the argument. Then comes the art of cross-examination by Wellman. This is the standard by which every attorney in America is trained in cross-examination published first in 1902. It covers a plethora of actual case histories where the answer, the questions and the answers are laid out for you. The best thing that can happen is that your opponent lies. When I go to jail and I have six policemen and I'm the only man in the room, I am in the best possible position when it comes to cross-examination. Because I'm the only guy there and I can tell the same lie more than once. And six of them cannot. Now that's what the bottom line is. It's called impeaching the evidence of or the testimony of your opponents. So when my opponents come in and they testify to a specific fact, like we never laid a hand on Mr. Gordon, you exclude all of the witnesses and bring them in one at a time. And you write out 25 or 30 questions, and you ask questions such as, where were you standing when the fingerprinting operation began? Well, I was standing behind Mr. Gordon. And Officer DeLeonard, can you tell us where he was and what his duty was? Well, he had a hold of Mr. Gordon's right hand and was attempting to take his fingerprint. Was it Officer DeLeonard who said, don't make any marks on him? The answer was, nobody said anything about making marks. I never heard any such statement. I asked him some other questions and then excused him and brought in Officer DeLeonard. 
Officer to Leonard, can you tell us where Officer Honey was stationed when the fingerprinting operation began? Oh, I think he was standing, uh, uh, I don't remember exactly, but I think maybe he was uh, behind Mr. Gordon. Was he the officer who had his arm around Mr. Gordon's neck? Yes, I believe that's true. And where were you stationed, Officer to Leonard? Oh, I was, I had a hold of the defendant's right hand trying to take his fingerprint. And was it Officer Honey who said, don't make any marks on him? Oh no, that was Larry Richards. <laughs> excuse, ask him 20 more questions, then you excuse him. Then you bring in Sergeant White. <laughs> and where were you standing when this began? Oh, well, I had hold of the defendant's left arm. And were you twisting the defendant's left arm behind his back? Well, yes, I was. And when the defendant cried out, no, no, don't torture me anymore, <laughs> is that when Officer DeLeonard said, don't make any marks on him? Oh, no, I think, I think he said that before I twisted your arm behind your back. <laughs> See the way you get this out? Now, what's my goal? All I need to show is police brutality. I don't care who was twisting my arm behind my back or who said don't make any marks on him. It's irrelevant. The fact that the six of them acted in concert in a conspiracy and then committed police brutality is the evidence that I need to collect my damages. Who it was specifically that twisted my arm or said don't make any marks on him is irrelevant. And that's what the art of cross-examination teaches. And if you don't know how to do that, your opponent will make mincemeat of you and your witnesses, and you will do nothing to him. It's like getting into a boxing match, and we tie your arms behind your back. Now, we're going to put Muhammad Ali in the, in the ring with you, and we want a good, clean fight. We want good, clean breaks in the clincher. Now, go to it. Now, what do you think is going to happen? You think you're going to hurt this guy very much? <laughs> think you're going to get hurt? And that's what happens when you go into court. The next item is called winning an appeal. Now you have to go into a case with the objective that you're going to lose. Every time I walk into a case, I say, well, I'm probably going to lose at the trial court level, which was going to force me into appeal. This is where I've got to win. So I begin my appellate strategy at the scene of the crime. Let me tell you about my wife's case last year to show you how important it is to prepare your strategy. We had a little family disagreement concerning one of our granddaughters. The son and the daughter-in-law gave the child to us to take, and while they were on drugs, they thought that we'd be a better place to leave the child than and with them, well, they changed their mind. But I didn't change my mind. And so we had written permission to have the child. Now, I suspected that in case there was a change of mind, my son having gone through my school and having been trained in courtroom strategy and procedure, that I would probably be up against a pretty tough opponent. He's a very bright young fellow. And I thought about it and said, hmm, what would I do if I were in his place and I wanted the child back? And I said, I'd charge kidnap. So when I sent my wife over to pick up the child, I said, don't come back unless you've got written authorization from the mother that goes along with the verbal authorization in front of witnesses from the father. So when she brought the child back on October 25th, 1988, one of the elements in a kidnap charge is that the child has to be taken without permission. There's a second element. The victim must be concealed. So on the 26th, she went into Gainesville with the baby to the prosecuting attorney's office, and she walked in to Gail and Richard Martin and said, we have the baby here. And Richard said, whose baby? Well, my boy Thor. Oh, 
why are you bringing the baby in to my office? Well, so you can meet the baby. And he said, sounds like exculpatory evidence. She said, you're right. And he says, OK, I've seen the child. <laughs> you're excused. And she went back home. Now, when the trial came down, instead of waiving preliminary hearing, she argued the preliminary hearing. In fact, it was the longest preliminary hearing in the history of Oklahoma, 48 days. Normal preliminary hearings last 15 minutes, maybe an hour if it's really a complicated one. And she brought 13 witnesses in on the first day, tore them all up. Now, the state's prima facie case must include inveiglement and concealment. What's her job? To prove that there's no inveiglement, and here's the document from the parents, and there's no concealment. Here's the affidavit from the county prosecutor in Ozark County that the 26th of October, the child was in his office, and he was told plainly that the child is kept over at the farm. This forced the prosecution then to amend the complaint and come back with child stealing. You know, I thought of that one too. I said to myself, what would happen if they were to charge child stealing? Well, there's five elements to child stealing. You have to take the child and then refuse to give it back. Well, there was no doubt but what she took the child, all right. And when the prosecuting attorney called on four or five occasions and threatened her with kidnapping and or child stealing if she didn't return the child, old acid tongue Jackie said, have you got a court order? Because without a court order, you don't get the kid. Pretty brassy for a granny, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but you see, she had already set up her prima facie defense. You can't have child stealing if you've got a letter from the parents that say you can have the child. And if you're preventing a crime, and the crime that was being committed was child abuse. And it's not against the law to prevent a felony. And that's what that is. It's a felony in, our, in Oklahoma. So the prosecutor then was forced to go back and amend his complaint and say, well, I guess this is a custody matter. And she said, well, let me join and demur, <laughs> which is the equivalent of saying, well, amen, brother. <laughs> Let's go argue the civil aspects of custody rather than the criminal aspects of child stealing or kidnapping. So the appealable issue had already been thought of, considered, and executed before the kidnapping ever took place. And that's the way you win your appeal. You plan the crime so that you don't have to do the time. Now I want to show you something else. When she went in, she went in without an attorney. She pled non assumpsit by way of confession and avoidance. She took the stand in her own defense and waived jury trial. If she hadn't done all four of those things, she'd be in the Oklahoma Women's Penitentiary today. The distinction between a winning defense and a losing defense is in the way it's executed. And she executed it with extreme professional skill. Well, that's called Winning an Appeal, and it's published by the Mitchie Company. By the way, the fellow who wrote that is uh, this guy's name is Markowitz. It isn't Moskowitz, it's Markowitz. And he's a professor of law at San Francisco State University. Hell of a good book. Did a wonderful job. The next one is called The Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. See, I already, I already have that there. What do you have in the margin? These are not so These are not annotated. These three books are not annotated with any court cases that have already been adjudicated. Then up here, there's a single book for $75, or you can get three books up here, but you can get it from Westlaw, and it's an all in one book called The Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. 
and the federal rules of evidence, which are akin to the other three, only these are produced by Clark Boardman, and it's these latter three that are $75 each that I recommend because they are annotated. Now, let me tell you how important the annotations are. Let's take Rule 8A2, the one that I said is absolutely essential if you're going to win a case. In the Clark Boardman book for $75, there are 25 or 30 cases where 8A2 has been construed by the courts, both winning and losing issues, so that you have an opportunity to see what the losers did and what the winners did when Rule 8A2 was brought into question. And I've always told my students from day one, what we want to do is to do what the winners do, and we want to avoid what the losers do. Then Bouvier's Law Dictionary, the 1914 edition, which is about $135, at $15 for uh, postage and handling, is 3,500 pages, and it is probably the best work in a legal dictionary that's ever been put together. Unlike Black's and other dictionaries, it goes further than just the definition. It actually gives you a full article like a legal encyclopedia, Corpus Juris Secundum or American Jurisprudence. And then it gives you a number of court cases that have been decided both pro and con using that issue, such as, but not limited to, rescission of contract. When you go to rescind Social Security, then the Social Security Act has no way out of it save for that uh, there's no statute that uh, lets you out of Social Security. There is no statutory remedy for escaping Social Security. When you join the Army, there is a remedy but called discharge. But in Social Security, there isn't. So there's an alternative legal methodology, which is called rescission of contract. And a rescission of contract requires some special handling. And Bouvier gives you an entire article on the subject of rescission of contract so that when you get into an adhesion contract, it gives you the alternative so that you can get out of the adhesion contract. Probably the single most valuable book I use. And then the last one here is called Proving Federal Crimes. Let me uh, give you a couple of illustrations. I brought four or five of them along with me here so that you'd have an opportunity to see just what do you do with such a book when you get it. Well, Proving Federal Crimes is a book that's used by the U.S. Justice Department. It's printed by the Justice Department, and every federal prosecutor has a copy of this in his briefcase. And it covers, with all of the court cases that go along with it, every strategic and procedural move that's used on the courtroom floor. Let's suppose that you were captured and you had 70 pounds of marijuana and you wanted to challenge the warrant as being improper. Well, in order to apply for a Fourth Amendment warrant, let's put yourself in the place of the policeman, and you want a Fourth Amendment warrant, you go to a magistrate, how many things have to be in that warrant to make it stand the test of the Fourth Amendment prohibition against unlawful search and seizure? How many of you know how many things there are? Anybody? Well, let me ask you this. If you don't even know how many there are, and then how in the world can you know what they are? And the burden for quashing the warrant is on you. So when the warrant has been issued, the theory of law is that the warrant is competent. And if you want to quash the warrant, then you have to come in and you have to tell the judge what's wrong with this warrant. Well, the first answer is that there's 32 separate indice that the policeman needed to have accomplished in order to have gotten the warrant issued. Did he cover all 32, or did he leave out two or three? Because if he left out two or three, and you could identify what they are, then your motion to quash will stand. 
But if you walk in and you say, Judge, this warrant fails because the prosecution has failed to state their prima facie is issue or evidence in the affidavit in support of the warrant, and the judge says, what did they leave out? And you go, boo, 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 like this, and he says, the warrant stands. <clears throat> the, the theory of law is, is that the warrant must be adequate, must be uh, proper, because you can't overturn it. Well, the first chapter in here deals with search and seizure and every Supreme Court case that covers all 32 issues. <clears throat> now, here's what it does for you. Your opponent comes in with a warrant and they've seized the contraband. You walk in and you challenge the warrant on six grounds and force your opponent then with the burden of going forward to prove that they did in fact cover those six elements and they either did or they didn't. If they didn't, then the motion to quash will be upheld. If you fail to show or if they can overcome your challenge, then the evidence will be allowed. Now, it isn't simply with, with uh, search and seizure. Listen to the nomenclature. It covers the Fifth and Sixth Amendment confrontation, the grand jury and immunity, pretrial discovery and disclosure, trial discovery of prior statements, jeopardy and mistrial, prosecutorial mis misconduct and vindictiveness, Judicial notice, the weight of the evidence and relevancy, demonstrative evidence, documentary evidence, and so on down the line. Every major legal topic that your opponent has to perform to prove his prima facie case is in this book. Now, when I first discovered it in 1985, I made it available to my students by simply advertising it. You used to be able to get this from the U.S. Government Printing Office until 1987, and then they took it off the market. So for practical purposes, you can no longer get it. So this is why I still publish this for my students. I contend that you cannot defend a case unless you know what your opponent knows. And your opponent knows what's here. And you can't overcome him unless you know what he knows. You left that the cost on that on here, sir. OK, proving federal crimes is $30. Or, let's see, it would be six ounces of silver. Six ounces of silver. Now, when you go to jail, which is almost always the lot of a pro se litigant, do we want to go to jail and then be released from jail after a month, two months, four months, and not be compensated for our loss? Certainly not. Man, i got to get paid when you lock me up. Now, there's two ways to do this. First of all, if you were innocent and you win the case, that is, the case that's brought against you, then it's the prima facie evidence of false arrest and false imprisonment. That's a civil rights violation for which you're entitled to compensation. But let's suppose we go to jail and we're put in there lawfully. I mean, you really were driving without a driver's license and you were properly arrested. Now comes the federal standards for prisons and jails, which has to do with inmate rights and the physical plan, sanitation, safety, and hygiene, food services, security and control, supervision of inmates. What would happen if they locked you up in jail and then violated your rights while you were in jail? Let's suppose that you were a Jew and they made you eat pig. Would that be a violation of your civil rights? Yeah. The answer is yes, it is. Not for a Catholic, but for a Jew, it is. In other words, there are literally dozens of rights that you have as a matter of law. Each and every one of those rights, when violated, constitute a separate crime. Now, the problem is, when you commit a crime, there's a policeman out there to enforce the law. When the policeman violates the law, where's the policeman to supervise the policeman? So the Supreme Court had this to say in Miranda versus Arizona back in the 60s when they made this observation. There are approximately 40,000 police organizations in the United States. Of the 40,000, every one of them commit a civil rights violation every day. There are 365 days in the year. Now take 40,000 times 365, and 
and that's about how many civil rights violations you have in a calendar year. How many of those do you think are prosecuted? Well, the answer is 26,000 a year, less than the number of police organizations and their activities for just one day. It's less than, than one 365th of the crimes being committed. Now, what do you do when you want to bring the local police, fire department, or somebody else into line? What if these people are violating the law, such as the fire marshal who comes into your office and he says, I'm here to make an inspection, and you say, I want a Fourth Amendment warrant. Can you do that? Well, in some cases you can, and in some cases you can't. I had a fire marshal one time, he came into my office at Barrister's Inn. Now, I originally opened Barrister's Inn in November of 1981, down at uh, Orson Merrill, Merrill's Mardi Gras. Then we moved to Chinden Boulevard, and one day a fire inspector came in, and the unique thing about when I opened the store, I rented an old insurance office, 2,500 square feet with four offices, a kitchen, and two bathrooms, a store. When I had the phone company come down, I didn't want to pay for a commercial phone, and I didn't want a commercial business, so I said, this is my residence. So I had the electric company, the gas company, the water company, and the phone company put in a residence uh, <coughs> service, even though it was in a commercial building. This is highly unusual. Most people will try to run a business out of a residence, but how many people try to live in their office? So I thought, well, let's test it and find out. So I did, I tested it, and one day the fire inspector came in, and uh, Peggy called me, and I came in, he's a great big guy, and I'm six foot, but I was looking up at this guy, he must have been six foot 19. And he looked down upon me like Superman looking down on a plea, and then he said, I'm here to inspect your fire extinguishers and your, uh, what do they call those, fire alarms, what do they call them? Smoke, smoke detectors. detectors. Smoke detectors. So my response was, who told you that I had any smoke detectors or fire extinguishers for you to inspect? And he said, well, you have to have smoke detectors and fire extinguishers, and if you don't, that's a separate violation. I said, well, gosh, I didn't know that. What law are you dealing with? And he said, well, it's the city ordinance here in Garden City, section 207.41. And I said, well, I'll be darned. Well, I didn't know anything about it. And he said, well, I want to inspect my hold of them. I said, did you come in here with a warrant today, or did you come in here unprepared? And he said, well, I don't need a warrant to conduct a routine inspection said, but this isn't routine, and you're not going to inspect here without a warrant. And he said, what kind of business is this? And I responded with, who told you this was a business? Well, I can see it's a business. Well, I didn't know that. I was unable to see that. And he said, what do you sell here? I said, I don't sell anything here. This is my home, and you're standing in my living room. <laughs> well, isn't this the Ajax Insurance Agency? No, they moved. They're up on Fairview. Well, well, this is a commercial building. I said, certainly. Well, you have to have fire extinguishers. I said, I don't think I have to have one in my home. He said, well, this isn't your home. I said, who told you that? <laughs> well, you can't live here. This is a commercial district. Is it against the law? <laughs> well, you better be in compliance with all the laws. <laughs> who told you that I was in violation of any law? Well, I'll be back. And he left. I never saw him again. <laughs> now, what this is is a routine fire inspection. And this fellow really doesn't know what his boundaries are. He doesn't know what his powers are and what they are not. 
but I do. I know what all of his powers are, and I know what all of his disabilities are, and I'm very good at getting right up close to the line. I learned this from my daddy. So I was raised in the era before child abuse. <laughs> and you just get so close to the line, see, but you never go over the line. And I know where the line is, and I never go over the line. But I make my opponent, you know, like the fire inspector and the highway patrolman, think that I'm just a real rounder. I mean, a total anarchist, a criminal, an evil, and a wicked fellow. <laughs> and then I'll let his conscience be his guide. Now, if he makes a mistake and he arrests me, that's false arrest if I can defeat him in the criminal prosecution, which then takes us up to the next level. Now, here's where my wife is. Here's the transcript of the preliminary hearing. This is the longest preliminary hearing in the history of Oklahoma. Judge Hass was emphatic on that point. <laughs> and let me tell you, when he started, he was the... Excuse me, George. <laughs> Didn't want to miss a word, George. <laughs> okay. We're back on... <laughs> word from your mouth is a gem. So. <laughs> then we got on the ship and we went the inside passage up to Alaska. <laughs> this Judge Hess, he was, he was quite a guy. He's a younger fellow. He's only been on the bench for six years. And he's very dedicated to the Bar Association. And he ground on my wife for about 45 minutes over the necessity and the importance, uh, and the importance of having an attorney. So what I did, so what she did was she weathered the storm for 45 minutes, and then she said, "Well, if we're through with this counsel issue, can I call my first witness?" Ooh, and she brought the first witness in, <laughs> and uh, tore the first witness up, and. And then called the second witness and tore the second witness up. And not too bad for a granny. And nobody expects this, you know, from a grandmother. You'd expect her to come in and cry and, and kind of not know what to do next. And expect the judge probably to take over and show her, you know, that this is what needs to be done next. But no, that's not the case. So on September 17th through the 28th this year, I'm going to use this case, that is the kidnap case, as the basis of my courtroom strategy and procedure for which this preliminary hearing that my wife did in 1988 is going to be the basis of the, of the class. This is an actual winning case. Here's the, Here's the grandmother who comes in and defends against the paid professional who is also a partner with the judge and they want to defeat her. And here's the, the rule that you have to follow. You have to put the judge into such a position that he has to rule in your favor or it makes him look like a fool. You cheated in a lawyer nothing? No. Remember, if you have an attorney now, you're dead. Which isn't too difficult when you remember that 90% of the trial attorneys are what? Incompetent. Now, if, you're, if most of your opponents are incompetent, then it shouldn't be too difficult for you to defeat him if you're competent. Now, is it? So that's what I shoot for, is to teach you to be competent. And then some of the time, though, you're going to go in against the best. Now, let me tell you, when you go in against the best, the money has to offer. When you file a civil rights action, the insurance company comes in to defend the county and the city. They hire Queen Smith, Howard, and Hull, who are the best that money can buy. So when you go up against an insurance company and their law firm, those are not the incompetents. Those are the best attorneys that money can buy. They all make a quarter of a million dollars a year. And there's four key rules that you have to defeat them on. 7A, 8A2, 12B6, and 56. If you can defeat them on those four rules, you force them into negotiations whether they like it or not. Now you can settle out of court, which is where 90% plus of litigation is settled. Now there's